Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm, I, I was just talking with Morgan here that the last time we spoke, his first child was one or two, and I was still leading a completely different company. Uh, and you were giving me really, really good advice as the uh, as partner at, at Collaborative Fund. Um, I, I remember we were discussing um, culturally sensitive technology and technology for yeah. Um, and, and, and your insights as always are, are invaluable. Um, I have reread the psychology of money, your first bestseller. And I was just complaining how I can't get to the end of same as ever, because there's so much information in every paragraph that it makes me go and read seven other, everybody's like, yeah, Morgan, why are you doing this to us? Um, <laughs> is that good or bad? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's here. <laughs> there, there was a, yeah, I remember what's that in the man, Marika. With, with psychology of money, I remember telling the publisher that the metric that I wanted to maximize for is how many people finish the book, not buy it, but finish it. You can never actually measure that. You can't know, but everybody, everybody knows the nonfiction book where after the third chapter, you're like, okay, I get it. I don't, I, I don't need any more. It was a good book, but I don't need 17 more chapters on this topic. So it was like, how can you actually get people to finish it? Um, for, for, for me, my, what I tried to do was like, okay, short chapters that can be read independently. Some people like that. Some people don't. I understand that the people who just felt like it was just scratching the surface and rather than going deep, totally get it. But I always, I think a lot of readers like a short chapter because they feel like they've accomplished something at the end of the chapter. You're like, oh good. Like I beat the next level. I can move on. There's a writer named Eric Larson, who I think is probably the the greatest living nonfiction writer. Uh, I don't I don't say that those words lightly, but he's absolutely sensational, and his uh, he's he's really mastered this. Where his book, The Splendid and the Vile, I think it's literally 200 chapters. Every chapter is one page, and it's so well done. It's so perfect, and you can't put that book down because you're constantly finishing a chapter, and you're like, oh, I got to move on to the next. And the opposite that every reader will know is. Um, the chapter that's 40 pages. And when you realize it's 40 pages, you're like, oh God, this is going to be a slog to get through. So that's that's what that's what I've tried to do with short chapters. But it's not just the chat. I mean, of course there are, and, and for those of you who are new to Same As Ever, um, there's the infinite uh, symbol, obviously, um, on the cover. And you tell at the beginning that like in French avant-garde literature, any chapter is to be read in any order whatsoever you please. Um, yeah. But there is a clever play with the sequence, right? There's a narrative being told in the sequence. And even in the in the table of contents, you're already telling us a story, which I found absolutely mind blowing. The last time I saw it, maybe when I was six and I was reading like children's literature and then Morgan Housel telling me a story. And, but it's, it's not a TLDR. It's telling you a story, almost like an intro. Uh, yeah. And then you're dropped. But what I what I felt was, and so I, I, I warn you, I see a lot of writers in front of me. So we will talk probably a lot about writing. I know this. I, you're you're probably used to it. People invite you to talk about money, and then we talk about writing. But these two things are very closely related, as we will see, because it's all about the story. Um, we we and we 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 could talk about writing the entire time if if that's what people want. <laughs> we, we will hear the questions, and and guys, feel free to ask questions also in the chat. We will keep keep track of that as well. The and I, I don't know, if, I'm sure this is you, but maybe you have an editor that you want to highlight here. The paragraph on paragraph, the sequences or the segues, it blew my mind because there's movement, right? You always feel that you are moving. And I, I was like, how, how does he do it? Maybe you don't want to like reveal the, the trick or if maybe there's no trick. Do you play a lot with like how the next paragraph should start or you've written thousands of blog posts and you've tracked, you know, all the analytics behind them and you just know what makes people read on. I, I can only compare it to, for, for me, and this is fiction, Susan Collins, right? With the Hunger Games uh, trilogy, nobody finishes a, a chapter better. Like it's another, the trilogy, I, I had to read it to write an article about it. I don't know when it came out many, many years ago. And I literally, I didn't eat for like three days because you're like, everybody, shh, I have to read the next, <laughs> I can't stop here. And then you realize yeah. like she's a TV writer, right? So she also had access to analytics. As you say, with a book, you don't get analytics. You don't know who finishes it, but with a blog post, you do. Do you want to yes. make a uh, your paragraphs? You, 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 you nailed it on the head with that last statement. I think for most of writing history, which was not online when it's just physical, you don't know how far readers make it down the page. And this is true, you know, 10 years ago, if you if you wrote a book, you had no idea. Did people make it to page, did they make it to the end? Did they stop at page five? You have no clue. 
with online writing, you do. There's a lot of data to be like, you, you can see exactly where on the page where people stop scrolling. Like that data exists. There's a couple of companies that will show you that data. And you learn very quickly as a writer how impatient people are. That even on your greatest hits, even the blog posts that people love, the average reader read half of it. And you can see this too with Kindle data. Where do people stop highlighting in the book? Because And use that as a proxy for how far they made it, which is a pretty good proxy. And you see this too. There was, a, there was a, an academic paper written a couple of years ago where they took the 20 best-selling books of the previous five years or whatever it was, and they looked at the Kindle data. And in the bestsellers, these are the books that people love, the average person made it a quarter way through. And so I think when you come to terms with, those, with that data, you have to, as a writer, just be like, understand how impatient people are and respect their time. So I always have this bug in my head when I'm writing of like, what's your point? Make your point, get out of the way. Do not ramble. Do not ramble. I'm not saying I don't, I've never rambled. There's some rambling in there. I'm not saying I've perfected this, but if you have that in your head, it's really important. The other thing that's important here is I think it was a Daniel Kahneman study where he's like, your memories of any experience are like 90% to do with the last experience that you had. So for him, it's the famous colonoscopy study where it's like, uh, I forget the exact details of it, but he used colonoscopy specifically because they're very unpleasant. And people whose last experience with it was either very painful or it was like not that bad, completely changed what they thought of the rest of the procedure. Like the, the last experience you have means everything. Everybody knows your favorite TV series that the, the, either the last episode is incredible or terrible and ruins everything. And I'll tell you that the TV series, not to go on a tangent, that had the best last episode that I've ever seen was Ted Lasso. If you watch that, the final episode of Ted Lasso tied up every loose end that existed. And it left you just being like, I love that show more than anything. Or you, but everybody knows if the last episode sucks, you hate the entire series now, even if it was great. And I think it's true for books. And so you can say the most important sentences in any chapter or any blog post is the first sentence in the last sentence. And it's very easy to ignore the last part. Every, every writer knows you need a hook early on to get people in. Yes, that's true. You also need to hook them at the end in its own little unique way to leave them, either like leave them dangling or tee them up for the next chapter. It's so important. I love this. And, and well, before the, 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 the literate era, we had storytelling around the fire where we had, I would imagine, hundreds of thousands of years of learning when the kids are nodding off. Ah, oh, yes, and yes. start talking and you're like, shh, I'm still Homer. I'm still talking. And then eventually you make the battle scene really exciting, right? In your epic, because you see that people are like making out and asleep and like yes. some more mulled wine around the fire. And you're like, you know, I have to get my epic together. I read this thing or was, no, I didn't read it. I saw it in the, the Ken Burns documentary on Mark Twain which was is absolutely fantastic. And he said that Mark Twain used to read his stories aloud to his wife and children before they were published. And he would specifically, he was intentionally studying the, the, their facial expressions. And he knew that when they were looking bored, he needs to cut that part. And when their eyes would bug up, he'd be like, oh, this is good. I should double down on this. And he would edit based off of this facial expressions they had when he was reading. And I was like, that's genius because that was the equivalent of like in the analog writing era of getting that information of how far people make it on the page. So that's, yeah, it's, it's, and I think no matter how much data you look at the, the takeaway is however impatient you think readers are, they're 10 times more impatient. They just, well, it's just, just like they can get bored so quickly. And then once you lose them for a second, they're out, they're gone. I used to work with a screenwriter, uh, I mean, screenwriter and, and uh, film director, very, very well-known English film director. And he was flying a lot, scouting for locations and going to auditions around the world for before he would you know, commit to a movie. And he always had a pile of screenplays for his next project. And whenever he was sitting at the airport, whoever he was sitting next to at the airplane, he would tell the story, but not as a movie. He wasn't like, hey, I'm a film director. I'm moving, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this movie. Um, he just told the story. And if the guy was like, okay, what happened next? He would take the, yeah. he, he, always, he called it the airport test, which I yes. find super, super interesting. Uh, there's an author, I, I might be butchering his name. I think his name is Vernon Klinkelborg. Does that sound right? Anyways, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like a Harry Potter or, or, character. Or, or, I don't know. Or, or, it's, 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 an, it's an incredible name. But he, has, he had this thing about writing. He's a very accomplished writer. And he had this thing where it's like a lot of writers will um, be like, hey, I'm building up to this big point that I'm going to reveal to you. And he was like, that's terrible. Writing should be beautiful in every single area. You don't want to build up to a big event with a bunch of dry writing that leads to this grand finale. 
every sentence, every chapter should, every paragraph should be good. Now, obviously much easier said than done. And I've written some, some shitty paragraphs and, you know, during, during, during this period too. But if you're always thinking that every line, every paragraph into itself independently should be beautiful rather than building up to something that's beautiful. I think that's important. The other thing I try to think about is I love the saying that people do not remember books. They remember sentences. And then if you think about it, like, I think it's true. Even if you said, what are my favorite books? I, if in each of my favorite books, I could say like, oh, there was this one line that stuck with me. And so it's true. People remember sentences. So therefore, as a writer, I often think like what you want is a collection of memorable sentences. And of course, like you need a narrative that they all tie together, but you want at least, at least every, every paragraph should have one sentence where you're like, ah, oh, that's a good one. That's, that's a memorable one. That should at least be the goal. Oh my God, I love this. My favorite last line currently is, is the last page of the Neapolitan Quartet by Anna Ferrante. You read a quartet, right? So you read, I don't know, 1500 pages. You spend months with this book. And I remember almost dropping the book because the last page is so, talk about tying everything together. I, I literally thought for a moment that it's my English, that I'm misunderstanding something. That uh, this cannot be this. Uh, you know, you look at the you look at the word on the page and it kind of like falls apart. And I remember I woke up in the middle of the night, I got out of bed to check, like, did I read this correctly? This is the last, this is the ending of this otherwise incredible book where every sentence is beautiful. You never yeah. feel like it was mediocre for this big bang at the end. Actually, it's so beautiful that you don't expect something. Like beautiful books usually end in a melancholy way, and the camera zooms out and the orchestra starts and like, oh my God. This did not feel feel like a build up, but it was. Um, so yeah. the life goals, right? It's I, I love it. It's so good. And every long book that you stick with is like that. Every paragraph is good. It's not that you're building up to a grand. Because back to the impatience of readers, ninety nine percent of readers will not stick with you if you're building up to a grand finale. They they need they they need stimulation in every paragraph to keep their attention. They can feel it. it it's like a it's like a, a magician. If you can tell, it's a trick. It stops being, it stops being, yes. or, or if you can, if you can see the seams, it stops being uh, exciting. But I, I read this about TV series that even like the most highly watched TV series, like Friends, the mega fans only watch two episodes per season. Yeah. So it's, it's the whole thing is really, it's maybe, maybe not now in the, in the era of binge. Uh, I'm going to stop for a second. If there are any questions, particularly about the craft of chapter built, like chapter construction and paragraph construction. Uh, and then we will uh, move on a little bit uh, in a different direction. Camilo, hi, welcome back. Hello, yes, two salons in a week. It's oh my, my God, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everything else uh, in life is this, uh, going this actively as well. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you so often. Yeah, uh, hey Morgan, great to meet you. Hey. Uh, Hello, Seattle, like here, coming from the other side of the lake. Um, my question is a little bit twofold. It's going to be like one of those financial analysts questions. But I've noticed that in many of the best nonfiction books, there seems to be this emergent format where it's like story or anecdote, lesson, insight, and then summary. And then that's kind of like the basic composition of chapters. And I'm yep. wondering, and I mean, I, you I see that in psychology money done so well, but I have a tension as somebody who writes of whether this is becoming like an imposed format uh, or if it's because this is the emergent best of best in class way to structure nonfiction books. And then parallel to that, I'd love to know a little bit about your research process in gathering the stories, uh, particularly for psychology of money, which is the book I'm the most familiar with, because I think to me, that's that's the secret sauce of the book. Yeah. No, great, great questions. I think the idea of the format of story, takeaway, that kind of thing, um, it, it can be very effective. You can also overdo it. And if you're doing it, if you're doing it just for the sake of the format, you, it's probably, it's probably not going to come through very cleanly versus, and I, I think maybe here's one way to explain it. Never once have I said, oh, I have this idea about investing. I need to go find a story for it. And I think if that's your process, it's going to feel forced. But if you're like, you come across a story and you're like, that's a good story. And it reminds me of this thing about investing. That's, that's the route that you want to take. It's starting with the story first, because I think the way that format that you describe breaks or doesn't work is when the story is obviously forced. 
you're like, I can kind of see how that story relates, but like, you're really stretching there versus if, I think if, if you start, if you were inspired by the story first and then you tag on the takeaway, it's much cleaner and it's much smoother and it's natural to do it that way. So that's, I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, you have to forgive me that I forget the second part of your question. Your, your research process. For re research, re research. Thank like you. Yeah. Amazing stories. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, as, and, and to kind of go on to what I said, I never set about to say, I want to learn more about this topic. I need a story to write about for this topic. It's all just unstructured and casual. What looks interesting to me? Oh, that look book looks kind of interesting. I'm going to read about this. Um, and I, I almost never read business or investing books or economic books. I read about, I like history. I like biographies. I like science books. I read, I read almost exclusively nonfiction. We can talk about why that is. I don't know if I'm proud of it, but it's almost all nonfiction. Um, but it's all unstructured. I have no, I have no intended goal of what I want out of it. But if you do that, all of you are readers, you'll know this. You're constantly coming across stories where you're like, oh, that's a, that's a good story. If there's, if there's one thing I might do, that's maybe slightly different because it's my profession is whenever I come across that, I highlight it and save it and log it and, and I make sure that I can access it later. And then, so I have, I have, uh, documents that are hundreds of pages long, just Google docs that are just stories I've come across over the years. And usually when I, when I find and highlight a story, I have no idea when I'm going to use it or, or, you know, or what I'm going to use it for, but I'm like, that's an interesting thing. And then when I'm writing a blog post or a chapter, whatever it might be, it can be like, Oh, remember that story I found seven years ago. I, I should go find that. Cause I think it's going to fit. You know, I, I think, I think that reminds me of like what I want to say here. And so like, once you have a collection of them, then that's, that's really the research process. It's never intentional. I think intentional learning can be great, but I think the unintentional, just like passive learning is, 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 is more powerful. I think it's always a good proxy you. to look at what your memory, like where your, where your talents of mem memory lie, because that's a good, that's a good career choice. I feel the same with internet like hosts and, 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 and members. Like I remember everything. I remember and what it, somebody said eight years ago and to whom and what they were referring to. And my editors are like looking through the pages, like, where was this? And I'm like, I just remember. That's why this is my job. You know, uh, this is like you have you have the zone of genius in your memory. And I think you probably have this insane associative memory when it comes to really grasping what is in the quote and, and what that might serve as a story for expressing. But just just the just the the good, just the good lines, just the good stories. I don't remember all of them, but I think, but I think when you're writing, it's it, like most of the time, this is the thing a lot of readers don't know is that when somebody is writing a book or an article or a blog post, 99% of the time, the author does not have any of that information in their head when they start writing a book. The process of writing is what teaches them. And I, that's definitely true for me. I don't have, I have no, it's not that I knew this stuff. It's just, oh, I started, I wrote one paragraph and I'm like, oh, that reminds me of this. I can, I can add it. The, and then I read another paragraph. I'm like, oh, didn't, that kind of like, jogs my memory. I think I found this story the other year, like a couple of years ago, it's going to slide in here really cleanly. And so it's the process of, it's the process of writing that teaches you. And there are so many, I feel like at least in how I quote to other people and I quote you very often, but I don't actually quote you. You share quotes and I forget who actually said that thing. And I say, oh, I know this quote via Morgan Housel. So I actually name drop you a lot. And I think you, chat GPT will be so confused eventually about this thing. <laughs> One of the quotes I use a lot via you, not by, um, is don't be a jerk as like the most important business. And maybe it wasn't even you who said it, but I'm like the Morgan Housel quoted somebody saying, don't be a jerk as like the most important business um, advice. And the other- Let's run with it. Sorry? Let's run with it. Let's say it was me. Yeah, yeah it was you. It was Einstein or you uh, <laughs> and Simone Weil. These are the three, three candidates. And the other one that I fucking love is if you want to be successful, figure out the price of the success and pay it. Yeah, yeah. And to me, that's, that's like- a guiding principle in my life. Like I saw that sentence. I have forgot who said it originally, but you, I think you tweeted it or it was in a blog post. I don't know. And I just, it, it made me understand everything in life. You know, it was one of those moments like in Arrival when she understands the alien language and how time works. <laughs> so thank you. I think it's, I think, it, I think that the last quote is true for virtually everything, like the cost of success and pay it. Because everything has a cost of success. Relationships have a cost. Careers have a cost. Investing, business, they all have costs. And so much of the success is just 
understanding. Like what is, what is the cost of a relationship? Oh, it's going to be compromise. And like, you can make a list of the costs and just be willing to pay those costs. And if you're willing to pay them, the reward is great, but you have to be willing to pay them. And so many people fail in every endeavor, relationships to business, to investing, to careers, because they either don't know the costs or they do that, or they know them, but they're not willing to pay them. They're trying to get a freebie. And so, yeah, I think that's, that applies to so many things. I love that. Yeah. I have a very good friend, a guy named Alex, who's an investor in London and he once talk actually I spoke at, at, a, at a professional event about this but he was like you know I'm at my second marriage he said the first one failed the second one I just figured it out and the rule is if your wife says she doesn't like you doing something stop doing that <laughs> it's, it's a great rule of thumb <laughs> and he was I, like I have... 15 years later three kids you know a holiday <laughs> home kayaking together it works just don't don't be, don't be a jerk <laughs> I was going to say, I have, I have high hopes for his second marriage. It sounds like he's figured it out. <laughs> yeah. He should be a motivational speaker. Um, yeah. I would like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how we look at Seinfeld. We look at these incredibly, uh, uh, incredible geniuses and think, oh, they were just born this way. And then you actually watch the documentary about Seinfeld and you realize like, no, he just did it a lot. There's this yeah. thing where they... Yeah you know, put out all the all the one pager stand up jokes that he has ever written. And it's half of half of New York City. Um, so I'm really, and I know that you have a very, very prolific, um, a couple of uh, decades uh, behind you when it comes to writing. Do you mind telling us how somebody becomes Morgan House? Or what what was the journey like? And what do you think, in the spirit of short and and and, and snappy paragraphs, uh, or, or, or chapters, what what were the most Im most important chapters in, in you becoming um, this best-selling author of two books uh, that you are today with us? Yeah, so I started writing in 2007. I was a, a blogger for The Motley Fool. And um, what was really important back then, it's not so much the case today, but back then every blog had a comment section. And in the comment sections, people will know, people will tell you in no uncertain terms how dumb, stupid, idiotic, boring you are. Now that particularly early on in your career uh, can hurt. It's not fun. But the, the upside of it is that the feedback loop is so tight and so direct that you very quickly understand what works and what doesn't because people will tell you when it's not working. And so you, so you know, it's like, it's true in any profession of like, you want to get better, you need a very direct feedback loop. And the other thing about blogging is back then, not anymore, but back then I was writing two or three posts per day so two or three blog posts per day with very direct feedback on every single one. And you do that for 10 years. And of course, you're going to improve in any perfect, no matter what you're doing, anybody in those circumstances will get better at what they're doing. Um, so that, I think that, that, that was really it. It's just, you know, I think in, in my whole career, I've written 3,500 blog posts, which equate to, you know, I mean, if it's a, a thousand words each, what is that? 30, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a lot of writing, but so it's just, there's no secret. It's just doing lots of it and paying attention to the feedback and figuring out what works. There is a little quirk here where of course, paying attention to the feedback, the feedback loop, that's really important. But I think where I improve the most in my writing is when I basically said to hell, the hell with everybody else. I'm going to write for myself. I'm going to write for an audience of one, which is me and nobody else. And I'm going to treat every blog post and every chapter and every book like it's a diary entry. Like I'm just writing this for me. And I consider, I hope to be a selfless person in most endeavors in life. But for writing, I'm like, no, to hell with everybody else. This is mine. And if you want to read it, good for you. But I'm writing this for me. And I think that was a huge turning point for my writing of like, A, I don't, I'm not going to pander to anybody. I'm not going to try to convince you of it. I'm just, this is for me. And I'm not going to ask, what do other people want to read? I'm going to say, what do I want to read? What is a what is a, a what is a lay what is a, a voice that I find compelling? What is a story that I think is interesting? What is a takeaway that's powerful for me? And that's the end of the analysis for that. That was a big that was a big improvement for me because I think a lot of people, like for writers, the advice of know your audience very quickly turns into pander to your audience, and it's an innocent transition into that. But a lot of writers pander. They're just like, I, they're like, I know what's going to get your attention. I'm going to give it to you. Like, no, that's not, that's not real. That's not natural. So I think if you treat, so like for the blog, I, I don't have any, I, I don't have an editor. It's just, I'm a one man band. Just go for it. For the books, obviously the publishers read it. And um, there'd be times when the publisher would be like, Hey, I think you should explain this paragraph better for the reader. And I'd be like the who the reader, like what? 
people are going to read this? Like, no, this is just for me. I don't, it makes sense to me. So why do I need to change it? But I, I, and I get kind of stubborn on that. I'm like, I don't want to explain it to a, to somebody who's not me. I want to write this for me. And I think writing for yourself is fun. And, and it shows in the writing. You can see the enjoyment in the writing. And writing for other people is work. And you can see that work in the writing. You can see that it's just a labor that you're putting into it. So that, that, that was another big transition for me. David Deitch has this um, theory of fun that I often think about, uh, where he basically says that if there are two people competing and they you know, invest the same amount of effort, learning, um, enthusiasm, whatever in their work, the one who's having more fun will win. That's yeah. the competitive advantage because you will be having more fun. You will not wait for the weekend. You will not wait for the evening. You will actually enjoy doing doing what you're doing. And that's in in, in moments of of hesitation, the fun. If, if the work is fun, you will continue continue. I said. Um, so I, so I, I've never I've never been a, a journalist, but the word in journalism that just makes me want to vomit that every journalist use is assignment. My editor assigned me this story. I'm like, I, that, that is just like, are, do you think you're actually going to do your best work on assignment versus just following your passion? Of course not. Unless you're an and adult. So, it's not school. Right? I know it's, it's terrible, but even like the top end journalists are like, oh, I'm on assignment. Like what? And so I think that's what I've always, I've just tried to do the opposite of that, of rather than assignment, even if it's like, oh, I, I'm like, I'm assigning myself. Like, I think other people will like this. Like, no, no, no. Just like, what's interesting to me? Let's just run with that. Oh, I love that. We had Caroline, Caroline Calloway um, recently for a super salon. Um, and she said this thing that is haunting me. She said that she wanted to write her book, a uh, scammer as if she had been dead. Like she kept asking her, like, how would I write? Because of course it's very autobiographical. It's a very different genre. But I, I, it, I ever, I've been kind of blocked as a writer almost ever since because I'm like, what would I write if I imagined that I was dead, basically? Like how honest would you be? How, you know, selfish in the best possible sense would you be just following your, not just passion, but taste? Yeah. And telling people like, look, I will, you know, keep this as legible as possible. And I will listen to your feedback. I will read the comments. I will read the love mail, hate mail, whatever you're throwing at me. But in terms of quality, you know, it will, it will, it has to be something that I would read. Um, yes. And, and it's and that's such a good, platform. a good metric of like, if you were dead, I, I, I have a book behind me written by Harry Truman and he wrote it just after he left office, which is what I think 1952. But when he wrote it, he told the publisher, I'm sure there's a contract. He said, you cannot publish this until my wife and I are dead. And, and, and then they did it because in the book, he holds nothing back. And he tells you exactly how he feels about some really touchy subjects. And he'll have no problem in the book being like, Eisenhower was an idiot for doing actually, like you, you, he can't say that if he's alive. So he waited until he was dead. It's a really good book, but it's kind of the same philosophy. He actually waited to his dead rather than just imagining what it would be like and writing there. But I think it's true. And everybody knows that like, like everybody filters themselves and they should. Like there's this, there's this great joke that I, life, that I love where he says like, the, the advice of just be yourself is good advice for like 1% of people. Like most people should not, should not speak exactly what's on their mind. So everyone filters themselves in a very healthy way, but everyone also knows that what you are putting out, what I write, of course I filter some things. Of course I have political beliefs and personal beliefs and social beliefs that I'm not going to share because I don't want to be canceled tomorrow. Everybody does. And so that's the, I, 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 that, that idea of pretend you're dead when you're writing this is brilliant. I love it. I love this. I have a very good friend as he's CEO um, currently and then he has a, a draft on his phone with like everything he, that comes up during his work that he can't tweet or share because it would be about employees or his investors, et cetera, et cetera. But I expect a kind of devil wears Prada um, startup edition to drop at some point. And, and for him, I, to, I think a lot of, I think the millennials, you know, we are, uh, my generation is still like in the middle of the startup journey or investor journey or wh whatever people are doing. And I think in 20 years, you know, when we will be like 60, a lot of these big reveal books will drop because people will have nothing to lose. You know, it's nothing to hold back. I often think too, like, just like a philosophical thought, how crazy would you realize the world is if you understood what people were thinking rather than just saying and writing? You would realize that people are a hundred times eviler than you think. They're a hundred times funnier. They're a hundred times more creative than they're actually uh, you know, writing and speaking. 
So ha- like what, whatever the boundaries of what you think society is, I think the actual what's going on inside people's heads, like that's just what they're willing to tell you. Like what's actually happening is orders of magnitude greater in either direction. I love your explorations of the numbers of how basically like every crazy event has like a billion times chance of happening every day because there are so many people doing so many things. I think you say that we do like 30, we take 30,000 actions per day. You're saying same as ever or something. And I was like, oh, I'm busy. <laughs> you know, people should take Yeah, you're doing I love like this. people. It was this, it was this experiment from Freeman Dyson where he was like, okay, oh, yeah, uh, the did. average person, the average patient takes, I think it was 30,000 actions. An action can be like, I pick up this cup. I like, I move my hand. And so yeah. if there's 30,000 actions across 8 billion people, what are the odds of a one in a billion event happening? It's like, they're going to happen all day, every day. And you're going to see them. So people, you know, have this uh, like, oh, it was a one in a billion chance. Like, yeah, you should expect that to happen several times a day. I have a strong belief that people who spend a lot of times with a lot of time with children know more about human nature because children do the crazy things unfiltered, the fun, yes. the evil, all those Ugh. things. But there's also something about older people. I love the Louis C.K. joke when he says that you know all, older people are so unfiltered because they are like a person who just got fired, leaving the office with their box and telling everybody like, "You're yeah. an idiot. I never liked you. You're ugly." Leaving <laughs> because like you know. <laughs> I, I remember, I remember talking to my, my grandfather, I was probably 16 and he was probably 80, something like that. And it was Christmas morning. So we're all like, let's call grandpa. And I get on the phone and he says, Morgan, do you have a girlfriend yet? And I said, no. And he said, all right, let me talk to your brother. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that, was all, that was all he wanted out of me. And I remember being like, that's when you're 80, you can do stuff like that. You can just say what's on your mind and be like, okay, I have, I have, I have, I have no more, no more time to talk to you. Move on to someone more interesting. I love that it's 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 uh there's the f u money and the f u age. Uh, yes, if you have a and very think- low age or a very high age, you know, I uh, I absolutely absolutely uh, I love that. I, I was just reading the Jodie Foster interview about Gen Z, and I'm like, I have similar thoughts, but I can't yet say it. You know, if you are like in your 60s and you kind of have your own, I don't production company, whatever the equivalent in show business is for perfect independence. You can just like say whatever. Um, I, I absolutely, absolutely love that. Um, yeah. I want to explore a little bit because we talked about the origin story of becoming Morgan Housel. And I really hope that your last book will be called Becoming or something very inspirational. Um, <laughs> <I'll see. laughs> with just your photo. Um, any, any, I know there are many, many writers here, Raza. Um, uh, any any uh, questions uh, to Morgan because before we fly on to the next topic? Um, yeah, I was just gonna ask about because you mentioned something that was very interesting and uh, it was a little bit counterintuitive to the things that we were taught um, in creative writing, and that is just try it and do not think about the end. Do not think about you know what really the take home message is. Just try it, and then at the end maybe you could add that or maybe not. Just leave it open for the reader to do some work. So how yeah. do you strike a balance for like doing that and also not make it? very like you don't want it to be very conspicuous and overt um in a way like hey i'm I'm teaching you but also you want this to be understandable in a way so how do you strike a balance again between writing for your reader and your audience like you talked about and also not overdoing it yeah i mean one thing i would say about like about just right is one thing this is probably bad advice so maybe people shouldn't take this but for me i've never understood like an outline and every writing teacher would be like, before you write, you need to outline it, what it's going to be. And I'm like, no, how can I make an outline? I have no idea where this is going to go. The process of writing it is what's going to show me where it's going to go. So how do you like, I, I don't know that preemptively. So I, I, I never outline anything. It's just, it's just right. Let's just start with one brave sentence and see where it goes from there. In terms of like striking the balance between understandable and whatnot. I think if you are in your, I think a lot of complexity is to try to woo the is try to woo the reader. And if you're writing for yourself, I'm not trying to woo myself or show off for myself. So so much complex writing and big words is just to show off like look how smart I am. Well, nobody would do that in a private diary because it's just you. So when you're truly writing for yourself, I think you naturally gravitate towards simplicity and understanding because that's how people think in their own heads when they're just talking to themselves. Um and almost all all complexity is just trying to like, hey, I'm a PhD. Look at these big words that I can use. I think that's that's true. So I think if you're if you're being honest in your writing to yourself, it's naturally it's naturally going to be very understandable. I, I would also say most 
I think almost everybody, if they're writing in a diary, will write better than if they're writing publicly. Because they, when they write publicly, they get nervous, they're filtered, whatnot. But if they're writing in a diary, most people are great natural storytellers. So I think it's a good mindset to have to just be like, just pretend nobody's writing this. Just write what's on your mind in a style that's that that makes sense to you. I think for 99% of people, that's going to gravitate towards something that's clear and understandable. Reminds me of uh, David Mamet's book, Three Uses of the Knife. Do you know this book, uh, Morgan? No, no. It's a t that's even say 80 pages, basically an essay on storytelling. Um, three uses of the knife. And it basically starts with this natural storytelling affinity that everybody has. Somebody arrives and says, you're not going to believe it. I had to wait 30 minutes for the bus. And then he kind of breaks it down how you construct this story. Because of course it was not 30 minutes. You have to find the number that is sufficient enough that people will be like, oh, I'm so sorry for you, but not so much that they don't believe the story. And then he kind of like goes from there and you know looks at everything from religion to blues, song lyrics etc cetera, etc cetera. It's, it's quite uh it's quite great but i'm thinking about there, there's this um a, a theory in sociology called low, low context culture and high context culture or low context communication high context and you know there there are theories that the us is a very low context culture that's why people are so friendly and smiley and that's why all the explanations are like if you were five so they don't get sued and it's right and you come to some like somewhere like portugal which is an extremely high context culture where i'm from budapest right it's a small country a small city there are so many cultural references that are understood by everybody so that's where you get often extremely insufficient you know explanations about things inside jokes half of the people don't know what's going on but they feel too embarrassed to ask and in the end you just have a population that just has no idea right and wow. it's a yeah. small group of people um and and i keep and you know there, there's there's a good argument to be made that the reason why u.s culture could spread so globally was because everybody can understand low context communication right because it's all, all always a little bit from zero but what you're when i when i look at the the equivalent of this in writing and, and what you're talking about, I mean, no, nothing is higher context than a diary, right? I mean, you're talking with yourself. Of course, you were there <laughs> when this happened. That's why you can write about it. And and I, and I love that this, that you, it, it sounds to me like in order to really safeguard your own taste and create your own voice, you have to let go of this low context communication because it's generic, right? Yeah. If you... If you your reader will be, want to become your friend and part, it's like a fantasy book, right? A fantasy book is a closed world, but you can catch up and you can learn the rules and we are malleable. And that's where, that's where we feel when we read you that, you know, you enter this different world. And I understand yeah. everything in it, but I, there's a little bit of an effort to kind of cross the threshold, which is, I think, the voice of the author. I love it too. I, I, I was say, I, I forget where I read this, but I read, uh, they didn't use the phrase low context culture, but the theory for why American language has become very simple is because we've always been a, me a melting pot of different cultures, different languages. So the only way that an Italian and a Russian and a German who moved to New York could understand each other is by using very simple phrases that they all understood. So we just ended up with like very cliche, simple phrases that we used to communicate. And the smiles, we right? For monolinguistic encounters. Yes. Like we were in yeah. Chinatown in like... 1903 you that was the only thing you know that could facilitate the i don't know whatever transaction you were engaging in yeah so i think i think that's the origin of it um i i, I do think um i i've always thought like the, particularly if there's an editor who's like oh you need to explain this a little bit better my thought has has sometimes been like no if people don't understand it they can go look it up like rather than slowing everybody else down just, and I, I don't think that's offensive to the reader because I think the opposite of that is just pandering to the lowest common denominator, which is not, which is not, I, I think it's fine to just be like, I'm going to run with this. And if you need to look up a couple of these definitions, like have at it. And th th there's nothing wrong with that. Like I, I do that. Of course, everybody does that as a reader. If I'm reading a history book, I constantly have to be like, oh, you just referenced that treaty. I've never heard of it. I might need to go, go on Wikipedia real quick and see what this is. No, okay, no, I understand it. I can jump back into the book. Nothing wrong with that. No, I, there's a balance. If people just have no clue what you're referencing, if you're throwing out acronyms, nobody understands, that's not good. But I think the opposite of it that a lot of authors will do is just like, it's so it's so boring and basic. What was I reading yesterday? I forget what it was, but it was it was in the Wall Street Journal. 
And it was an article that on the headline, I was like, oh, I'm interested. Let's click it. And the, the first paragraph was the most kindergarten basic bare bones explanation of this topic. And I was instantly, I was just like, I don't, I don't have time for this. It's not. And, but it was probably a topic. It was a topic that I was interested. I forget what it was, but that's where like, you, you really got to be careful making it accessible to everyone. If you make it accessible to everyone, it's interesting to no one. Oh, that's so, so, so interesting. I always feel that the reason why I haven't had too much harassment on Twitter is because not everybody understands what I'm saying. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it should stay that way. Um, that's so, so interesting. I, we had a, an incredible salon a couple of years ago with George Pecker from the Atlantic and yeah you know, the, the, the kind of apropos for the salon was um, uh, George Orwell, Why I Write. Um, and, but we talked a lot about Pecker's book that had just come out at the time called Our Man, which is one of the best biographies I've ever read in my entire life. It's, when you're reading something that's the, the kind of the, the culmination of a type of writing, and I felt that this is kind of the best as, as good as 20th century American journalistic English can get, that you're yeah, kind of reading yeah. the Bach of this genre. It's it's phenomenal. And and it's about Richard Holbrook and the whole like Pax Americana and the 20th century, the, 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 the history of 20th century American diplomacy. It was very personal for me because the middle part is obviously about the, the, the war in former Yugoslavia when I was a child, you know, it was kind of raging uh, on the other side of the border. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenal experience. And, and it was only at the salon when I realized that this book doesn't have footnotes. And I'm a complete yeah. sucker for footnotes. I love it. I always think that that's where the author puts what he really thinks. And But I don't, didn't notice it. And I'm like, oh my God, I was reading this book for like a thousand pages. And, 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 and Pecker revealed that his ambition was to put everything in the main text, never distract you. And yeah. what extra information you will need here so that you don't go off to Wikipedia, you don't check your phone. And I think that this density and this spacing of the book that really stays with you and the end, as you say, the end of the colonoscopy was great. So it was a great experience, the thousand pages <laughs> um, of yeah. three wars, so fun. Um, and I, this is this is brilliant. And we live in this era of like academics being pushed to write airport books, right? Um, yeah. And it's basically just just um, um, uh, footnotes. Maybe the plagiarism scandals will lead to even more referencing yeah. who will get scanned. But it's the the mastery is putting it in the text. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I always I always be. wince. I always wince when there's a footnote that basically says like the opposite of what they wrote in the text, or it's like it or like adds. Re I'm like, why can't you couldn't have just said that in there? But yeah, I, I'll give you one really silly example of where I think people go too far. The Economist, which is a great publication, they will write like Goldman Sachs, comma, a bank. And I'm like, who is reading The Economist that doesn't know that Goldman Sachs is a bank? Like how? Like the, so sometimes when you when you need to explain everything. To, to the lowest common denominator, it just slows it down to a, to a huge degree. Like, yeah. And so that I think, but I think there's, there's a lot of that of like Donald Trump, the former U S president, like we know who he is. You don't need to, that's just added words. I know who the guy is. Okay. So I think, I think, I think you can, you can go too far in, in either direction there. And, and it's a free market when it comes to writing, right? So the audience also self-selects and I, I'm sure, you know, when, when you choose your titles and your intros, you're, basically inviting the audience to self-select into your readership yes yeah because if I, you said, but, you know, but there is how i, I think got maybe, my bikini buddy you know you would get different people clicking on it i do think maybe this is like this is showing the complexity of it because maybe this is the opposite of what i just said just to show that this is a balance i do think there is a sense of like this is the um, footnotes this is the footnote to this is this is this is the footnotes I do think I want everything I write, and I'm not always successful at this, but the goal is that if I write an article about investing, a hedge fund manager will gain something out of it and a complete novice will understand it. So I do think you can do that. I've tried to do that with like with storytelling because a story is understandable, but hopefully there's a takeaway that even an expert will be like, oh, great, that's that's interesting context. But but you have to do it naturally. I think if you're if you're trying to dumb it down for someone, it's gonna it's if you're dumbing it down, it's just gonna come across as dumb. And if it's too complicated, like you're not gonna, then it's just like an academic paper that nobody understands. So there's there's like there's obviously a, a balance to it, but you can go like I think I think a lot of writers go too far in either direction, and then end up in the Sokal affair or something like that. Um, Camila, you have your hand up before I move on to the next section. Please take the floor. It's just, Maureen just said something that just 
there's like something that is just like driving me nuts, which is I feel like there's this dissonance in particularly the corporate world. Like you talked about the power of stories, but then if you look at business writing, you know, like emails, product briefs, anything that's like in a company, it's so stale, bland, sterile, you know, PR comps. And I have some theories as to why there's that dissonance, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on why do you think we know that stories are powerful, yet pretty much every form of ring communication in the business world, at least intra company, well, even PR releases, is just so like bland and, and sterile. I think I'm, 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 this is not the full explanation, but maybe some of it is like in most business emails, it's just like, the, the subconscious is it's like, Hey, we're, 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 we're not friends. We're not buddies. I need something from you. You need something from me. Here it is like period send goodbye. Whereas like people are good storytellers when they're like, Oh, you're a good friend of mine. I want to make you happy. I want to see you smile. Like, let me tell you a good story. So I think most people who write bland emails are pro they probably have a great story that they could tell you at the bar after work. So there's a, there's a lot of that to me what, where I think it's the most destructive is not in business. It's in academia. Where actually one of the things that ChatGPT is very good at is taking a dense academic PDF study, white paper, and saying, summarize this for me. And when it spits it out, it's like, why couldn't the author have just written that summary in the beginning? And there is so much great, amazing, life-changing information to come out of academia that is lost amidst giant words that nobody understands. Uh, and it's intentionally written in a way that they are performing for other academics but that comes at the cost of everyone else understanding what the hell they're talking about. And uh, once in a while, you do have an academic who can write and, and will write for a, a lay audience and they're doing it naturally. Daniel Kahneman is kind of that. He can still be kind of academic, but um, thinking fast and slow, virtually anybody can understand that book. But that's very rare, particularly where in sciences where it matters most, like biology and medicine. Like if you try to read a cancer research paper, Forget about it. You can't. You don't understand a word of what they're saying. At least I don't. Um, and that, and that's that's tragic. I think. I think it would be great if lay people could search through a catalog of cancer studies and be like, "Oh, that's neat." Now, uh, th there's a balance because a lot of why I can't understand it is because they're using concepts that are that I that, that I don't understand. But they need to be using those concepts. But they're talking to each other and they're not writing for a lay audience. Um, so I, I I don't know if that's an answer for your question, but I think a lot of it is is performative of just like I just need like I mean here here's here's one one thought. If you are just like you need to call Comcast to change your password, and you and you finally get someone from customer service, you're not going to be like, hey dude, what's up? How's your day going? How's everything going? You're just going to be like, I need to change my password. Just change it and let me off the phone. So a lot of it is just like getting to the point as quickly as I can. But you're also not going to be like, sir, I have a query. And if you have a, mo like, you're not going to like create some class-based cloud, word cloud that makes it impossible for the other person to understand that you're trying to uh, change to change your password. It and maybe, maybe this is, maybe this is just grumpy, cynical Morgan, but whenever I'm on customer service, a call and they, on the other end, they're like, how's your day going? I'm like, I, I don't, I, I just need to change my password. Okay. I don't want to tell you about my day. Maybe that's, maybe that's me being grumpy that day, but yeah, there is like, there's a time and a place for just like getting to the point of what you're trying to say. And I, I worked in customer service when I was a broke immigrant and um, I can tell you that we appreciate that. So <laughs> I, I no, I, I, so because I we have I, to I, get rid of you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Numbers, exactly. so. Yes. I saw, I saw this joke the other day. The joke was everyone who works in customer service should be allowed to fight one customer per day. Oh my goodness. I think, Wouldn't I that think, be great? I think they do, actually. I think they do. <laughs> you, have, you have freedom to tell one customer today to fuck off. That's oh what it should God, be. I love this. You guys know this. There's a, a, I, I don't know where it is, but it used to be on Tumblr. Probably it's on Twitter now. How may we hate you? It's New York concierge's best anonymous stories of like the craziest shit that all the customers ask in New York hotels. I love it. Oh my God, it's perfect. It's, and, and, and to go back to the evil and the fun in human nature, you know, and I, these are the loveliest people. I mean, who would become a hotel receptionist? Clearly not people who hate people, right? Like they are actually trying yeah. to help you. Yes, <laughs> go even into yes. hospitality as a job. And you can still, you know, get like be so annoying. <laughs> they will just 
first of all, take the piss without you noticing, probably, and then anonymously blog about you. <laughs> and I just yes. absolutely love that. There's, there, there's another uh, side of this where I think the best litmus test for sizing up somebody's personality is how they treat service staff. You can see that, particularly for if you are wealthy and powerful, how you treat the service staff is like a very telling window into your personality. There was, wasn't it, maybe this is a, a, a an urban legend, but there there was this story of the CEO who hired people, um, like who was in the process of hiring people and then they he would take them, you know, the last round was the executive dining room and it's like super high pressure, everybody's in their best suit and, and suits and dresses and like you're, you're, you're having this expensive food and that's like the last round is this lunch with the CEO and then it, there, it was a kind of built up scene that the waiter would mess up the order for the for the candidate and like how 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 do they react at this point they think that they have won right they think it's the sure thing like the the contract is in the mail so it's pretty pretty accurate they are maybe no longer trying and i just i just absolutely absolutely love that i wish that could be done (laughs) yeah no that's great i'm curious so what was the right answer to do because i would just I almost certainly I would just put up with it. If I ordered chicken and they brought steak, I'd be like, all right, we're eating steak. I guess that's what we're doing. But but that's not a good trade either. I think you might want the employee who can stand up and be affirmative in their beliefs. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I don't remember, but clearly not shouting the waiter's head off. Yes, exa- I don't exactly. Know. Yes. Maybe there are some investment funds where they, you know, that's the expected and, and, and useful behavior. Um, yeah. we, we have an equivalent of that um, at InterInTech where we just like all our customer service people helping hosts and attendees know that, you know, we like look at the tones of emails that we receive. And like, we had one guy, like we have one a year and I just go and I just, you have, you just fire this user. And you're like, yeah. we don't want to hear from you and you should not go to salons and you definitely should not host because if you can't handle the stress of having to click on a zoom link, I don't know how you will be leading maybe a long series with people from all over the world who might, you know, there, like you have to improvise, and and it's just, it's such a strong proxy. Um, yeah. Do you ever feel like um, you're giving away secrets? Do you ever feel like you figure out something about human nature or how how to make more money? And this should not go on my blog. Um, this should be I just, don't I, because that's what I feel do. like. You you give away the secrets, which I absolutely love. Um, how does well, it closer feel- to it? Is I feel like I'm just trying to figure out myself and figure out my own problems and my own relationship with money and my own flaws and my own, and then, and then share those. So I, um, I feel like that's, that's more, that's closer to it rather than like uh, sharing a secret of society. I'm like, Oh, I've, I've learned this about myself and maybe you'll relate to that too. I usually don't frame it like that, but I think, I feel like everything that I've written is like, it came from trying to solve my own problems. Um, which, which is, but that's what makes it a really fun career is like, you can just sit back and be like, try to figure out your own world and then un- try to understand something within that, that is teaches you about human behavior and then try to write a story around that. And so I feel like the biggest beneficiary of my writing has, has been me. And I, I don't, I don't mean financially. I mean, just like learning about, about myself. It's just like a, it's like a 40 hour a week therapy session. It's kind of how it feels. <laughs> Oops, sorry, I accidentally uh, switched off my camera. What? I love that. It's, it's therapy that you get paid for, right? As opposed to yeah. the other way around, which is which is great. Um, what do you think was the the biggest problem that at the beginning you were trying to solve? And and was there any anything that you didn't even know was a problem and somehow it, it got solved in the course of your, your writing journey? And it's not a journey, it's an odyssey <laughs> by, by this day. Yeah. In terms of like numbers. Words. One thing that's really hard for me is that most new bloggers have no readers. So the stakes are pretty low. It's like, it's probably just you and your mom reading this early on. So it's like, it does, don't really matter. Since I started The Motley Fool, I was a brand new writer. I'd never written anything, but because I was using their platform, my first blog post was getting hundreds of thousands of views, which is a benefit. It's an advantage. It's also terrifying because it was just thrown straight into the deep end. And as anyone would in that situation, I sucked early on. I had no idea what I was doing, but since hundreds of thousands of people were reading it, I had hundreds of thousands of people telling me how much I sucked. And so I think early on, it was just like desperately trying to find the right voice that was palatable for other people, just desperately trying to figure out what worked. And because the stakes felt high, I was getting paid for it. And a lot of people were reading it, even though I had no idea what I was doing. 
Um, it was, it was a stressful time early on the, like, I, I, I really hated it the first three years I did it because I needed a paycheck, but I didn't enjoy it whatsoever just because I was trying to figure out what the heck, what the heck I was doing here. So that was, you know, that was a, a trying time of like trying to solve that problem of just like, it just felt like survival. Like, how could I just survive? How could I just not get eaten alive while doing this? That was three years of writing every single day. Um, and what, what else? I think, um, the transition for me from, I'm an investing writer to I'm a, I write about the economy to, I just kind of write about behavior in all formats. Those transitions were, were kind of bumpy along the way too, because, you know, I had, you know, 10 years ago, I was like, I write about the stock market. That's it. That's why I'm a stock market writer. And then it was like, I'm an investing writer, a little broader than the stock market. And now it's, I just think of myself as just like, I just, I'm just trying to figure out how people's heads work. That's kind of how, that's kind of what I write about. There's a lot that's money related and finance related, but those transitions were always kind of tough. And I think they were, I was naturally gravitating towards, towards those areas. But once your identity is, I am an X, I am an investing, I'm a stock market writer. Transitioning away from that can be hard for you and hard for whatever readers you have that are trying to follow you. And every one of those transitions, I think I lost a lot of readers who were like, Morgan, I liked you when you were writing about the stock market. Now that you're writing about the economy, I have no interest in that anymore. But so then you got to just have the fortitude to be like, well, this is where I want to go. And I know that some people are going to fall off the train along the way. And that's okay. Like I'm going this way. And if, if you want to get off the train, that's perfectly fine. No hard feelings. That's so interesting. This, if you do something, whatever you do that becomes a routine leads to self discovery, right? Because it yeah. gives you sample samples. It gives you data. It gives you comparable events compared to which you can see your own evolution and your own thinking. Um, yeah. so, so at the beginning, you did not write about biases and kind of cognitive distortions that much. Is it because you became more interested in your own biases and kind of fighting them? Is it because, I mean, the rationalist movement, the post-threat movement, the whole Kahneman movement became more popular? Um, what, how, how did, yeah, how, how, what led to the, the behavior analysis? And, and you're writing about everything from the U.S. Army during the Second World War to the ancient Roman writers. I mean, this is really the, the stuff that never changes. I think it was interesting for me, mainly because um, it's different now, but certainly in the mid 2000s, 99% of financial content was analytical. It was, you should buy this stock because it's trading at this PE ratio. And I just thought all of it was bullshit. I just think I just didn't think it had it had any relation to reality. It had no track record of working. And so I, and particularly after the financial crisis in two thousand eight, um, it was an observation of just like a finance textbook had no explanation for why that happened. An economics textbook so had no explanation for why that happened. 2007 and one year later we had the crisis boom boom happened i started in late 2007 it was almost like instantly as soon as i started writing shit hit the fan and so just trying to make sense of the financial and not crisis. because of you not because you uh, answered, not because of I, you. I, I i try not to take it personally yes i but but the observation of like finance textbook doesn't explain 2008 economics textbook doesn't but a psychology textbook does like keeping up with the Joneses, that's all sociology. Greed and fear is all psychology. Political science explains the bailouts. So all these fields that had nothing to do with finance it perfectly explained where there was a hole in finance. And I also decided it was much more interesting as a writer that I, I don't I don't want to write about PE ratios and like spend my life in Excel, but telling a story about behavior, that was really fun. That was intriguing to me. So A, I, I think it got you closer to the truth of how people actually make decisions with money. They don't make them at the spread on a spreadsheet. They make them at the dinner table where it's just much more about relationships and psychology and sociology. And it was just much more interesting. If I have to spend my life writing all day, I don't want to write numbers. I want to tell stories about people. And I wonder if you think that by basically never fully leaving the financial writing framework, it also forces the story to be a little bit more honest. I love this quote, yeah. which is by Ajim O'Shaughnessy. I have no idea. I completely forgot who said it first. Uh, apparently, it's a banking adage that, okay, it works in practice, but can we make it work in theory? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because finance is about actually what works in, in practice, right? Um, it's like yeah. medicine. Like, I mean, Razan here, you know, writes incredible, you know, human behavior analysis and life meaning of life analysis, um, extrapolating from her medical practice. 
and that's as true as it gets. It's the material world. Yeah. You know, if you write about Elon Musk, and I and actually everybody that you bring up in the chapter about geniuses also being anti-hero. Crazy. Heroes being yeah. yeah, like you can't have somebody thinking outside the box and keep keep it, keep them in the box. Like these two things are antithetical. And everybody I think that you mentioned there is hardware, right? So you have Musk, you have you mentioned jobs, you mentioned Boyd the extremely unpleasant <laughs> innovator in uh, of of uh, not just uh, air, 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 air how is it called um oh my god um air warfare is that a word no yeah I'm no i i i don't think there's a more specific word okay. than that yeah. um and 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 he, and then he kind of like creates this incredible chart that i think is going to be my background on my computer going forward about how how uh, teams should deal with new information and these are all atom guys Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's and it's like, sure. I, mean, I think a lot of this for me, like in finance, if you're taking an analytical approach, it kind of forces you to be precise and say the answer is 1.264. And of course you can use like a confidence interval. You can have some uncertainty, but it forces you to be overly precise in a, in a very uncertain world. So in a spreadsheet, you have to have a specific answer. Whereas I think when you're doing narrative psychology, you can be like, some people think this, other people think that. We don't know this. I don't understand this. To each of their own. You can't, on a spreadsheet, you can't say to each of their own. On a spreadsheet is what is the answer. And so that's why I think so much of finance was just individualistic. And so you couldn't, anal you, you couldn't explain it with a formula. You could only explain it with a, for a story about why people were doing what they were doing. I'm going to stop for a moment if there are any questions. Um... Or if anybody here identifies as a crazy genius, we would love to hear from you and also invest. But you have to be in the hardware. That's right. Any questions from the chat? John. Morning. Morning. Hi. Hey. Um, you said you talked previously about reading stories and then how can you share any anyways how you catalog them? I mean, do you just have an expansive mind that somehow you keep all of them in your head? But like when you're like, yeah, there was a story I read some years ago and you want to build a build some kind of insight. How do you reference back to it? Tools, yeah. processes, anything? Uh, for for 99 percent of my history as a writer, it's been very messy and informal. I literally have a Google Doc called Neat Stuff. And I just dump a bunch of crazy words in there. And I think it's like two, 200 pages in a Google Doc of just links, quotes that I just dump. There's no organization. About a year ago, I started using the app uh, called Readwise, which for people who are familiar with it. And I, I love it. It's a very effective way to catalog and search and organize a lot of those thoughts. Um, I'd say half of my reading is Kindle and half is physical. I prefer physical, but I like the highlighting searching of Kindle. It's much more effective. Readwise, which by the way, I have no dog in this fight. I'm not getting paid by Readwise. Um, they make it very good that if you're reading a physical book, you can take a picture of the text and and highlight the passages. And it it it's so clean and seamless. So um, so now that that's what I do. If like I'm reading a physical book, I'm constantly taking pictures of the text and cataloging those quotes in Readwise that you can go back and search and highlight and comment on. So it's so that's that's how I've tried to improve it over the last year from the very informal way that I've historically done it. I use this for translation because I'm in Portugal. So I look at the recipe on the box and I have no idea. And then Google Translate tells me, get it out of the oven. It shouldn't go in there. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so it's good. You just have to get the timing right. Um, yeah. This uh, to go back to the right like you were dead, like, right like it was for yourself. Do you feel that there is something that you couldn't write down? just yet um, because it might be too controversial people because you tell us so much about ourselves but it's like at least I'm ready to hear it like I, I'm not like no way Morgan how dare you I don't do that I'm like yeah well I do that you know <laughs> it's like let's yeah it's a, it's a fine it's a fine balance between I want to be as honest as I can and like and right from the heart I also don't want to be canceled. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't want to be, and not, not only that, I, I don't want to be controversial. I don't want to write things that are going to piss people off. I and mean, maybe that's just because I'm too sensitive, but of course, when I'm at a bar with my, if I'm talking to my wife and I'm at a bar with my friend, 
I'm, I have views about things that I would not write about. Of course, I have views about politics, religion, social forces. Of course I do. That I, it's just like, I, look, of course I have these views and I'm going to tell some people, but like, there's, there's no upside to write. There's a lot of downside and no upside to writing it. But I think that's true for everybody. Of course, every, everyone's like that. And, and maybe, maybe the people who do truly speak from the heart, 90% of people hate them. <laughs> they're, they're, the, they're, they're the political pundit that is truly telling you how they feel and how they feel is repulsive to most people. And so that's, and, and I have, you have those views. I have those views. I think, I think knowing, knowing how to filter yourself is a very big part of, of maturity of knowing that like, yes, I have this view, but I understand that you disagree with it and I have no desire to fight you and there's no upside to fighting. So let's just, just keep it. Like, I, I understand why you believe what you do and I hope you understand why I have a different view, but that's fine. That's, that's the nuance of how the world works. And so and I, I feel like most people who are like, I'm just telling you how I feel. It's like, no, you're just trying to fight. You want to fight. You're not. You're. You're not just telling me how you feel. You're looking for confrontation that I have no desire for. And I add that's absolutely. And, and sometimes people say things to provoke you or to provoke a reaction out of you. It's not really about the yeah. content. It's just trying the different buttons. Um, any any questions? Sorry about uh, being convergent because uh, to me it seems like if you find the right voice, you can actually convey a lot of what you want to say in within your own voice. Um, yeah. and, and it's, there's kind of an art to expressing even potentially controversial ideas in a way where people are ready to, to receive those notions, right? I mean, maybe you don't want to talk about certain biases via political tribalism or religious affiliations, but you can tell that story through an anecdote about the second world war or this musician or this investor. Um, I mean, I, 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 I didn't know about the the snickers was was the most popular yeah yeah I mean, there's a whole there's an entire t piece of history in that quote um, I'll, I'll tell you once one specific example from same as ever there's a quote in there that i talk about um it's from a german civilian in the 1940s and she talks about why so many germans embraced hitler in the 30s why they did it and the very short story is like their economy was such a mess that when hitler came along and said i have a better way a lot of Germans were like, great, sign me up. Let's do it. So I, I use that quote in the book. There was an editor from the publisher who said, hey, I just need to let you know, this quote is is very offensive and, and I disagree with it. And I'm, uh, you know, I understand this is, you're, I'm quoting a German civilian, but what she's saying is is ridiculous. And I said to the editor, so, you know, thank you for your feedback. I understand why you would think that, but I think it's a good thing to put in there. I, I didn't, you know, so I think there, there are times when you're like, look, I know, and I'm sure because the editor thought it was offensive, I'm sure other readers find it offensive too. But at, so at some point you have to say like, look, you know, sometimes the realistic world is, is messy and, and gross and offensive and evil, but it's, there are a lot of topics where it's like, I would rather embrace that than pretend it doesn't exist. So it's, it's always a fine balance, even though I don't want to be offensive or I don't want to get canceled. That was a, that was a situation where I was like, yeah, I, I, I see where you're going, but I, I still want that quote in there. Are, are there situations where you feel that in like the, the recent past that you really got something wrong or that you really quoted somebody where that, that who, who had turned out to have been completely wrong? And if you feel that way, do you use like upcoming pieces to kind of set Set, set it straight or how, or, or you're just like, well, I saw that then based on available information, let's just move on. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What, 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 yeah. Certainly early on, if you go back to 2007, 2008, I was attracted to a lot of the doomers of like hyperinflation right around the corner, dollars going to zero. It was appealing to me. I think a lot of it is because I was 22 and immature and, and, and I didn't know any better. I didn't understand how the economy worked at all. So it was just when I read with it, like, oh, that, that makes sense. Now, in, in hindsight, like I, 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 I really don't respect any of, those, any of those doomers who are just like constantly trying to scare the shit out of you. Um, they're almost always wrong. And I think it's just, it's immoral to try to you know, wake up every morning and try to scare and anger people. Um, so they, there's definitely people who I used to admire and I used to quote that I never would anymore. And that's true in the future. I'm sure there's people who I quote I quote today that 20 years from now I'll be like, no, that that person was appealing, but not not really right. I I hope that I'm I understand things 20 years from now that I don't today. I I I hope that there's a lot 
that are in both of my books at 20 years from now, I will, I will disagree with. Cause that's a sign that I've like, I've learned a little bit more. Nobody should pretend that whenever they write something that they figured out the ultimate truth and then they're never going to change their mind about. I hope people go through life realizing and like having experiences that make you realize that life is more complicated than you once thought. And not to mention that you, that you learn from having been wrong. I mean, one of, one of my favorite pieces by you that I still very often think about um, is the, 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 the essay where you write about people who survived the great depression and the lasting risk aversion and the lasting scars that those experiences leave you with and you look yeah. at it from a generational point of view and it we actually have um uh, a planned salon with peter turchin who writes about the cliodynamic cycles of history and this seems to be a completely mathematically correct insight that yeah. scarred generations behave in the same way their entire lives like yeah. you're left with, I don't want to use the word trauma necessarily for financial behavior, but I often think about this because I had multiple different stages in my life. Um, and I'm currently in the post-immigration recovery stage, if you, if you will. And, and I very often think about like what might have happened to my brain in the period when I basically lost almost everything. Yeah. Other than yeah. my knowledge, but like my knowledge didn't matter because I was in a new environment. My social status, my name, my degrees didn't matter. I lost most of my economic, you know, uh, prowess. And and I often think about I tr I, I try to be self critical about becoming too risk of us. But at the same time, it's yeah. great. Like it was like startup runway. Like trust a triple immigrant. You know, <laughs> like she will yeah. have money. It's fine. Yeah, but. But there's, I think this is important too, because I know Anna, like you and I are are the exact same age, but you were born in Hungary, is that correct? And and I was born in the United States, and so we should not pretend that both of like both of us know things about the world that the other doesn't, and both of us are ignorant about the world in the way that the other is too. It's not to say anything specific about either of us, but people who've there's no way that somebody who was raised in the United States has the exact same view of the world as someone who was raised in Hungary. Of course not. And, and there, and so I think it's true for everybody. And so just understanding and respecting those disagreements, this gets back to like, if I have opinions about the world, there are things that I could say, like, I firmly believe X, Y, and Z, but I also know that I only believe that because I'm a college educated white American male. And I think you can, I think you have to hold both of those things at the same time. I firmly believe X, but I only believe it because of this and everybody including you, everybody has, has a version of that. And that's why it's like, yes, I have this belief, but I'm not going to share it <laughs> because, because I know it's just, it's just unique to the experiences that I've had in life. And the great power of writing about the entire history of human experience, right. And the things that never change is because these differences of who was born, where stop yeah. measuring, right. If the Roman you know, general did the same thing and the medieval Pope thought the same way and then the enlightenment philosopher made the same mistake. Maybe it's a little bit in, at least agnostic of the, the, the generational and geographical, um, yeah. uh, you know, kind of randomness of, of life. This is so interesting. Is there is there any advice that you wrote down and thought, I, I have to take this advice and you still couldn't? Is there something on your uh, list of your own advice to take in 2024? I mean, I've definitely gravitated more. Oh, here, here, here's one. I mean, there's a chapter in Same as Ever about expectations and low expectations and whatnot. But well, yeah, Truman, right? Like Truman was popular because everybody expected him to suck. Every, 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 and so everyone he thought he was an idiot. Yeah. But, but there's, here's, here's an thing. analysis of Carter versus uh, Reagan about the same thing, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, but well, I mean, here, here's another thing. I think uh, Jimmy Carter is one of the most incredible examples of everybody hating him when he left office and everybody loving him today. Who doesn't like Jimmy Carter today? He's the best like rehabilitated reputation that I've ever seen. But I think a lot of that is because when he left office, his expectations were so low that when he went on to be a nice Southern gentleman building homes with Habitat for Humanity, people are like, this guy's great. Everybody loves, everybody loves Jimmy Carter. How do you hate him? But here's the thing with expectations of like taking my own advice. And Obama so is my, the opposite, right? Like everybody loved Obama and now yes. look back and it kind of ha knowing what happened after, which might absolutely be independent of him, actually. Yes. Carter was also blamed for things that he didn't do or just like the, the, the outcome of older policies, right? 
it's hindsight is scary. I mean, you know that you yeah. wrote about that. Yes. And, and so my, my first book, Psychology Money, sold, sold very well. And psych, same as ever has sold okay, but it pales into what, what Psychology Money has done. So even going into that, I'll tell you, a, a couple months ago, I was talking with a, a very successful author whose first book sold 20 million copies and his second book sold 500,000. 500,000 by any metric is a mega blow away sensational success, but relative to 20 million, it's a lot less. And I asked him how that felt. And he said, even though I knew it was going to happen, it still hurt. It's, it, it's still, and it caused him depression when it happened. Um, so even when you ha keep your expectations low and going into it, you're like, I know that what I did before is not repeatable. It still hurts. <laughs> so that's the thing where it's like, you can write about low expectations, but actually implementing them in life is, is harder than you, than, than, than it's, it's much easier to write about than it is to actually do it. Oh, that's so interesting. First of all, I both books are different and they are incredible. And I, maybe there will be a sleeper success there. But I think it's called the second album effect. Um, and sophomore slump. Sophomore slump. Yeah, yeah. And there is this there is this uh, publishing joke when the author comes to the publisher with his second book. And it's amazing. And the publisher reads and cries and laughs and has a catharsis. And it's like the best thing ever. And then looks up at the author, very sad to disappoint him. Like, oh, I wish this was your first book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think with my first book, everybody's expectations were low. Mine were low. The publishers were low. The readers were low. And I think with the second book, everyone was way too high. high. You should have talked. Well, to okay. Me. I was like, this is going just to you. be a success. Okay, just you then. But I think there's a the thing with like, um, you know, for the second book, everyone's expectations are too high. So it's, there's only, you, you can only go down from there. But even if you know, again, even if you know what's going to happen, it's still more painful than you'd think. One of the weirdest thing that, uh, things that happened to me uh, at Interinteract, and this is, I mean, some incredible things happened. You know, I completely changed my view, uh, views on humanity, leading this company and, and getting the chance to speak to thousands and thousands of people every every year. Um, and generally just the, you know, the idea of, um, the ideas that I had were also a little bit closer to doomerism. And now I'm this, um, butterfly chasing optimist, um, in the garden, um, deeply believing in human goodness and trust and friendship. Um, but the more difficult moments are, or like more surprising moments are when somebody calls me up and says, Anna, I did what you said. I quit my job. And I'm like, I'm sorry, who are you? And then it turns yeah. out that this person read this thing that I wrote three years ago and completely forgot about, had nothing to do with keep quitting jobs. It was about something completely different. It was like an analysis of an Ingmar Bergman movie or something. And I, if you ever want, are happy to share, I would love to know whether this ever happens to you and how you feel about it. I, I'm sorry, if it's a too personal question. No, we, no, it, it, it does. Because I don't, because this is the risk of like when you're writing for yourself and you forget that other people are going to read this. It, when I, I, it's the same thing. If someone emails me and says, oh, I read Psychology of Money and um, my wife and I canceled our summer vacation because we think we should save the money instead of spend it. I'm always like, I, I hope that was the right decision. It may not have been. Like I didn't. And so it's, yeah. And, and maybe it was the right decision. But you realize like, yeah, if, if you're writing for an audience, like the, they're going to take what you say seriously. So to, I, I did some consulting for a guy a year ago. And on the first day he said, be very careful what you tell me because I'm going to take every word you say seriously. And if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. So be very careful about what you say to me. And I was like, <laughs> like, all right, like don't, but I, but I, I think, I think a lot of readers take that same thing too. It's easy to think that the author is like, no matter who the author is, it's like, well, this person wrote a book. So what they're saying is true. And therefore I'm going to take everything they say as gospel. And it's like, no, that's, that's almost, that's almost never true. It's like, these are my ideas. Your results may vary. So take it just like, you have to make sure it works for you. I mean, it's better than the other way around because, okay, canceling uh, the summer holidays, it's a, uh, you know, a loss of an experience. But if somebody called you up and says like, Morgan, I did what you said when you were writing about Heraclitus, I dumped all the fab college money of my kids into this new scheme. And yeah, you would be, you would be, uh, but it's so, so interesting to me. And, and I, I completely agree that this comes with just like probing the meaning of life 
in so much of, of one's writing that people will have sudden and, 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 and surprising takeaways from it. There's yeah. a Dennis Leeward of poem that goes, two girls discover the meaning of life in a sudden line of poetry. I, who don't know the secret, wrote the line. Yeah, oh, that's good. And I so that's often good. think about this. Um, it's, but you're saying that basically it should never hold back the author uh, or should not never grow into timidity or restraint that yeah. people will, you know, sometimes react in very personal ways to yeah. your writing. I propose yeah, to her, like I canceled the summer vacation. I changed all my money to crypto. Thanks Morgan. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know who you are. Sorry, we never, we've never spoken. <laughs> And there's and there's some there's some of it where it's like you just got to understand how complex the world is and sometimes like if people are going to misinterpret what you write and make their own decisions there's nothing you can do about this. I remember uh, when Obama was president. This is a weird example. His motorcade was driving through somewhere, and I forget the exact details. We can look them up. I don't want to I don't want to make the story up, but it was some. I think there was either a bicyclist or another car who because of the motorcade died. Like a bicyclist like got run off the pass and died. And I remember thinking like. What does Obama feel about that? Like, it's not his fault, but he caused it. Like, but it's not his fault at all. So I think there's a lot of that in life where you're like, I took an action that adversely impacted someone, but I don't think I should feel guilty about it. It's just kind of how the, so I think with writing, it's like that too. Like, I didn't tell you to cancel your vacation. If you interpreted it that way and did it, there's nothing I can do about that. It's not, I shouldn't feel guilty about that if it was the wrong decision. Oh, I love this. Thank you so much for sharing. We will do one last question, which has to be brief and not an essay. Uh, before we wrap up, anyone? Billy? Dave? Eduardo? Any questions? Or Camilo again? Do we let him go again? Guys, you decide. Yeah? We'll let somebody go. should let somebody should go, but I have one ready. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Um, why do you live in Seattle? Because I live in <laughs> Seattle and people hate on Seattle. And hopefully you can help me convince Anna to visit Seattle sometime this year. Uh, I think most people who hate Seattle have never been here. It's, um, yeah, like every city, there's things you can complain about. But I think from April to October, it has the best weather in the country. In the winter, it has some of the worst. But um, I think it's I think it's a great state. My uh, the reason why I live here is my my wife grew up here. Her whole family's here. That's how we ended up here. I grew up in California, um, but I I love it here. Even if we didn't have family here, I think this is where I'd want to live. Um, it's a great place. No income tax. Plenty of water, which a lot of places cannot say. Um, tons of economic prosperity. Most people don't realize. I mean, it's obvious, but you're like, who's located here? Amazon, Microsoft, Boeing, Expedia, Costco, Starbucks, T-Mobile. There's a, like, it's one of the most prosperous cities in the world. And I think most people who are like, oh, Seattle sucks because of X, Y, and Z. They've never actually been here. They certainly never lived here. But I mean, like, like every, it's, it's not perfect. Every city has its flaws. The one, the one nuance that I'm sure you will appreciate is that Seattle proper is very tough and it's going through a really tough time. The, the surrounding suburbs are amazing. Uh, that's, that's kind of the nuance around here. Amen. That's, maybe I, I I should go and and do, there are so many Internet Tech members in Seattle. Maybe I should do a Pacific Northwest tour. Morgan, thank you for joining us tonight. This has been incredible, and I learned so much. And I took so many notes. No sleep again. Thanks, Morgan. I still you're welcome. You're welcome. Because of because you told me, you know, like, and you're like, I'm sorry. I, where did I say that? Well, by not having footnotes, I had to research everything. Is there is there a quote or an advice? A piece of advice that kind of like percolates in your mind right now and and you want to share with us something that you want um you know to, to leave with us um after I, I remember i remember someone writing in psychology money it was a review and it was a negative review it was a one-star review and they said you can summarize this book just by saying to each their own and that they meant that negatively but i was like no, I think that's good. I think that's, I think that's like, I, I, I take that as a positive. I think that is for both books. It's like, there's no one right answer for everyone. You just kind of like the world is a complicated, messy place and to each their own. They meant it negatively, but I was, I was like, no, I think that's, I think that's true. I love it. That's how Chad GPT paused the Turing test on Goodreads, right? That you, yes. you absolutely summarized 
and we will remember forever. Thank you so much, Morgan. This is thanks. Thanks for convincing everybody to go and visit Seattle. I think we just needed this last push, um, and and this is what we will remember from the salon. Thank you so much, and guys, so much great feedback is coming in. I'm so happy that you had a good time that you learned. If you couldn't ask your question, or you know you close your laptop and then it comes to you in five minutes and you're like oh my god why didn't i think about this before tweet at us come to the community discord send me an email i will get it to morgan uh thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the date or sleep tight it was a pleasure as always and i will see you at the next salon that i'm hosting so yeah thank you I will, I will post the video so this there will be a memory of this bye bye thank you morgan so much this was incredible